In a flourish of diplomatic engagement at State House, President Adam Obaro today received four letters of credentials of ambassadors from Norway, Tanzania, Ghana, and Sweden. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has arrived in Russia for a first summit with President Vladimir Putin as he seeks support in its nuclear deadlock with the U.S. The number of climate change activists arrested at London protests has passed 1,000 as a police crackdown continues. These are the headlines. More coming on your way on the world today on iAfrica TV. It's 10.30 p.m. in Istanbul, 11.30 a.m. in Washington State, 19.30 GMT here in the Gambia. You're watching the World Today Evening Bulletin. We now kick off with our first story. President Adam Obaro received four new diplomatic envoys today as his government continues to strengthen its bilateral ties with other nations. Ambassadors from Norway, Tanzania, Guyana and Sweden presented their credentials to the president at State House this morning. The new Norwegian ambassador to the Gambia, His Excellency Gunnar Adrias Holm, said her country is dedicated to maintain its tie and continue to support the Gambia, saying Norway has a long-standing relationship with the Gambia. He added the two countries have many areas they can collaborate with, such as peace, security and climate change, among others. Ambassador Holm revealed that Norway is ready to support the Gambia's reforms as well as in the areas of sustainable fisheries management, renewable energy and tourism. The new Tanzanian ambassador, His Excellency Mohedini Alai Mobeto, told waiting journalists after presenting his letters of credentials to the President Baro that the Gambia and Tanzania have an excellent bilateral and multilateral relationships. He said, like the Gambia, Tanzania has a vast land for agriculture and is encouraging Gambians to exploit the area in Tanzania and vice versa. He reiterated that Africa can only develop if Africans support each other. He added, time has gone when we wait for others to come and help us develop our own countries. Presenting his credentials, Dr. Cyril Kenria Conti, ambassador of Guyana, said relations between Gambia and Guyana started way back in 2009 and since then the relationship has grown to higher heights. He added it's time to change the dynamics between the two countries after 10 years since resuming diplomatic ties. Ambassador Hunter added he will exploit the down of diplomatic approaches which could add weight to the relationship. For his part, the new ambassador of Sweden, Her Excellency Marie Lesner, expressed her delight uh, in being in the Gambia at this very important part of her history. She said the past three years has been great for Gambia as democracy, rules of law and human rights have been restored after two decades of oppression. She added Sweden will support the Gambia in her reform, especially in the reinforcement of human rights. The accredited ambassadors will be overseeing the Gambia from the various countries they are based in, namely Accra, Abuja, Pretoria and Stockholm. North Korea leader Kim Jong-un has arrived in Russia for a first summit with President Vladimir Putin as Pyongyang seeks support in its nuclear deadlock with the U.S. The talks organized in secret and announced at the last minute will be Kim's first face-to-face -face meeting with another head of state since negotiations with U.S. President Donald Trump in Hanoi collapsed in February. al Hassan Sisei gives us. Ahead of tomorrow's summit, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un arrived on Wednesday in the Russian Pacific city of Vladivostok by armor train. At the railway station, Kim was solemnly welcomed by Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Igor Mogolov and Oleg Kozenyako, the region's governor, the foreign minister said in a statement. An orchestra played North Korea's national hymn and honor guards greeted Kim on a red carpet. Addressing the Russian welcome delegation, Kim said he hoped his visit to Russia would be useful. He added that he and Russian President Vladimir Putin would discuss bilateral cooperation and resolution on the Korean Peninsula. On his way back to Vladivostok, Kim visited a museum built in honor of his father's visit to Russia. Russian side intends to strengthen the positive trends on the Korean Peninsula and will continue to reach in serious agreements on the settlement of the Korean problem, Kremlin official noted. 
Kim's visit to Russia will mark his first foreign trip since a February meeting with the U.S. President Donald Trump in Vietnam's capital Hanoi. On the Hanoi summit, Yusakov said that despite of the lack of visible results, both sides showed willingness and interest in continuing the dialogue. This is Kim's first visit to Russia and is set to last through Saturday. Reporting for iAfrica TV, I am Al Hassan Sise. Kim Jong on there in Russia to meet Putin with regard to its nuclear opposition by mighty U.S. Sanasabali, a senior member of the Armed Forces Provisional Ruling Council, who is implicated in several executions, has admitted to arresting and humiliating senior officers of the Gambia Police Force for reportedly staging a counter coup after the July 22nd military takeover. Testifying today at the TRRC, Sabali said he has found uh, senior officers in the office of Ibrahim Chongan after receiving a tip from an unnamed female police officer while he was at State House. Sabali told the commission that their coup was precipitated by the presence of Nigerians in the country coupled with other factors such as corruption by senior government officials. Saja Sambu gives us more. Sanabi Sabali was the former vice president of the Jame regime and has been a key in decision making and the pioneer of the coup up till the time he fell out with the former president Jame, where he was jailed for nine years before being released then fled to Senegal for his life when he thought he is being targeted by the government. Sanabi Sabali told the commission about the rampant corruption, oppression, political intolerance, nepotism during the PPP regime compelled the military to overthrow the government in order to change the injustice in the system and save our dear land from doom. Sam recalled when his dad passed away, he went to the justice minister to get his dad money in numerous occasions, but was told by the secretary lady that he needed to bribe them to get his money. And Gambia Bay along the whole Gambia knows at that time, the, PP no kono. the time of the PPP, Things that were happening in this country, corruption Corruption was everywhere. Because personally, myself, I have an example out for, for that corruption. May on the fourth, nineteen ninety-four. May on the on the May on the fourth of May, nineteen ninety-four. My my father died. Ntara curator, minister of justice. I went to the curator at the Ministry of Justice so that I can get his little pension, which is very small. Uh, it's, it is his money. I went there since May. For July, take over time. Up to July, the time that we took over. Every day I got there. And every day. Till one day there was a woman there. Secretary Lom. She was a secretary. Officer. She told me, officer, I see you every time you come here. What brings you here? I told her, you are the people why I am here every day. I came to collect my father's money. Sanabi Sabali continued to say upon taking up the country, they received information that certain military officers at the Yundum barracks were planning a coup and they went to the barracks to fight the unknown enemy. Okay, in Yundum barracks, is Lieutenant Baro there? He said, no, he's not yet there, but I believe he is coming. Index. Another call came from this airport, and this was one Lance Corporal Kebe. But here we have two Lance Corporal Kebe's at the time in the military. Lance Kabul Kebe Alaji and Lance Kabul Kebe Amadou. But at this particular point in time, I could not identify exactly who among these two was being talked about. But it was like Alaji, uh, Lance Kabul Kebe was talking from the airport. He also was asking the same situation if Lieutenant Baro was in the camp. I told Ibrahim B.I. communicate normal. And then he told him no, he was not here, but maybe very soon. What happened after that? After that, we took Ibrahim B.I. out. We kept him in the cells, I believe, if I could fully remember. And then we went to the guard room. At the guard room, we ambushed. We laid low. Since we now know Lieutenant Baro is coming, we laid ambushed for him. When he came, he was arrested. He continued that Lieutenant Basiru Baro and Dot Fal were executed at the Fajara barracks 
while some of the officials who were taken to Nyambai Forest in Brikama, where they were shot at plain blank range. We removed the head of the snake and the body was useless. This is a military term. You executed the head of the snake? Completely. Can you tell us how that happened? I stood the soldiers and told them, we have to kill Baro and Dotfal. They were the ringleaders. Here we were concerned only for the ringleaders at this particular point in time. So they were secluded? Yes. And then what happened? We shot them. And I personally, I initiated the shooting. And it was not just you who shot. Y members of your team shot. Could be. Not could be. They did shoot. Here I would say, if all of us have fired, there would have been a lot of casualties. None of them uh, could have come out. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Sabali, yeah. uh, you are under oath. Okay. And uh, the former vice president of the APRC, Sana Sabali, who later fell out with the council, acknowledged his wrongdoings at the time and pleaded for forgiveness and mercy from victims and the general public at large. But proceedings are adjourned till tomorrow, Thursday, to complete his testimony. Sajo Sambo, I Africa TV News. That was Sajo Sambo reporting on what most people have described as a straightforward testimony by the famous Sana Sabali. A growing number of Democrats say they would return to the U.S. compliance with the 2015 nuclear pact war power struck with Iran as President Donald Trump continues efforts to, to scuttle the agreement. Senator Elizabeth Warren, widely re regarded as one of the top Democratic contenders for the White House, said they would return the U.S. to the 2015 agreement which saw Iran accept unprecedented curbs on the inspections of its nuclear program in return for billions of dollars of sanctions relief. al Hassan Sise gives us more. A growing number of Democrats say they would return the U.S. to compliance with the 2015 nuclear pact. World power struck with Iran as President Donald Trump continues efforts to scuttle the agreement. Senator Elizabeth Warren, widely regarded as one of the top Democratic contenders for the White House, said she would return the U.S. to the 2015 agreement which saw Iran accept unprecedented curbs on and inspections of its nuclear program in return for billions of dollars of sanctions relief. While Iran has repeatedly and consistently been verified to be in compliance with the agreement, Trump was repeatedly called it unfair to the U.S. and one of the worst deals he had ever seen before exiting the May 2018. Trump called on the U.S. negotiating partners, China, France, Germany, the European Union, Russia and the United Kingdom to follow the U.S. lead in leaving the agreement. But to date, none have arguing the joint comprehensive plan of action remains the best way to ensure Iran does not attain the bomb. Democrats are expected to have their first primary debate in June that will kickstart a flurry of campaign activity ahead of the Democratic Convention next summer. Reporting for iAfrica TV, I am Alhassan Sise. The number of climate change activists arrested at London protests has passed 1,000 as the police crackdown continues. The Metropolitan Police said the number of arrests hit 1,065 and 53 people have so far been charged. Extinction Rebellion protesters staged a die-in at the National History Museum on Easter to evoke a mass extinction in the world-famous attractions entrance hall. Extinction Rebellion protests have been moving through London since 15 April, blocking Waterloo Bridge, Oxford Circus and Parliament Square. More on this insert. More than 1,000 people have been arrested in London since an environmentalist protest started a week ago, British police said. 71 people have been charged in connection with an ongoing protest organized by the environmentalist group Extinction Rebellion, a police statement said. On Tuesday, protesters marched to Parliament Square, leaving their makeshift camp at Marble Arch, which they had occupied since 15 April. Demonstrators carrying flags and banners marched to drums and chants as they set off in the morning. London police had allowed approximately 500 demonstrators to remain in Parliament Square until midnight. Organizers of Extinction Rebellion have said they plan to march the city's finance centre on Thursday after spending the night in Parliament Square. Last week, environmentalist protesters occupied four landmarks and thoroughfares in the city, Oxford Circus, Marble Arch, Waterloo Bridge and Parliament Square, demanding urgent action from the government to tackle climate change and the world's growing ecological crisis. The protesters also vandalized Shell Center, disrupted traffic and public transport in the city. 
The London protests have been staged as part of an international climate rebellion organized by the Extinction Rebellion, a group which is promoting civil disobedience to bring attention to the effects of climate change. Formally launched in October 2018, Extinction Rebellion wants the government and other institutions to declare a climate change and ecological emergency and to address biodiversity loss and reduce carbon emissions to zero by 2025. The group also wants the government to create a citizens' climate assembly to promote ecological justice. Coming up after the break, the UN Security Council adopted a resolution which encourages a survival-centered approach to preventing and responding to sexual violence in conflict and post-conflict situations. I'm <laughs> It will be a story to Funo Kono. It will be to be Gambia Dow that pity for Babel. It is a channel Dow that is a temple tower. What a man, what a man. The other body was service. Balo service, Dinkirala Jampo, woman can not call her court. Balo service, Al Demano, Kajako, Ali Dumur Fiol Sang, Ali Dumbaya Mori, and Ala Kanun Tol, Watu Bela, and Watu Sudum Panam Kono. Balwo service la dinkiralu ani la do kunyolu e do banko karo beto kabirin carton ko koyna nalla fa ko kotan so balwo service la kolto ali commande telephone la no la melbuko 9402137694319 wala 3192870 wala han kabi alta internet do ali la kolu jibe www.balwo.com Welcome back. We remind you that you're watching the World Today Evening Bulletin. Let's now take a look at the remaining stories. Actor and activist Alec Baldwin today held a conversation with representatives of the indigenous peoples groups on how to respond to attacks on indigenous peoples and other environmental defenders in order to protect their, li their rights in the tropical rainforest where many of them live. Speaking about the consequences of everyday consumption, Alec Baldwin said the activities of these governments do not represent the will of the people. As long as I've been uh, politically conscious, we've been hearing about the rate that the, uh, those areas are being deforested. And I think the people who really have the, the interests of the land and, and the interests of the greatest number of people in relationship to that land are indigenous peoples. Mm. If I said to you, you need to conserve energy, you need to eat less meat, you need to alter your behavior just a little bit, and if you don't want to do that, then we're just going to go kill a lot of indigenous people. Which would you rather have? How many people would choose to murder indigenous people in order to increase how much meat they eat and how much oil they burn? It, the activities of these governments do not represent the will of the people. They don't. The United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Victoria Tolkorpus, said the main actors involved in the killings of indigenous activists are transnational corporations, mainly those involved in extra active uh, industries, lodging, mining, as well as oil and gas extraction. Listen to her in this insert. Uh, actors involved in uh, in the killings are uh, are okay. uh, transnational corporations, mainly those involved in extractive industries, lagging, uh, mining, as well as oil and gas extraction. 
Fahapat Ruka Sanbolingi, an indigenous people's activist from Indonesia, said they are not opposed to the development. She said, we understand we need development. We call government and private sector go and intensively the existing license that you already have. For us indigenous people in Indonesia, we are not opposed. To, we, we never oppose development. We understand that we need development. And our we, we call the government and private sector go and you ent intensify the existing uh, license that you already have now. You don't need to expand because expanding means you will uh, uh, grab indigenous lands and you will destroy the forest. The government of Malawi, in coordination with the World Health Organization, launched the world's first malaria vaccine in a landmark period program. The country is the first of three in Africa in which the vaccine known as RTS will be made available to children up to two years of age. Ghana and Kenya will introduce the vaccine in the coming weeks. Kate O'Brien, Director of Department of Immunization, Vaccines and Biologicals, World Health Organization, said as much of a milestone as it is, it is an imperfect vaccine against a complex disease, but it is also a vaccine that has a significant potential to save lives and deliver on the health aspirations that we have for all children around the world. Much of a milestone as it is, it is an imperfect vaccine against a complex disease. But it's also a vaccine that has significant potential to save lives and deliver on the health aspirations that we have um, for all children around the world. The anticipation is that there will be about 360,000 children each year who will be vaccinated across the three countries. Pedro Alonso, Director of Global Malaria Program, World Health Organization, said the question could be, well, why not wait until we have something better? The question could be, well, why not wait until we have something better? Well, and the answer to that is because we know we're dealing with a very, very hard organism. And that's why I mentioned before this is the first vaccine against a human malaria parasite. Parasites are uh, really complex organisms, much more so than a virus or, or a bacteria. And that's why it has taken 30 years to develop this first vaccine. I always remember when 30 years ago, we, as many others, were developing insecticide-treated bed nets, they were met with similar skepticism. Oh, they only prevented 40% of clinical malaria. Oddly enough, the same level that this vaccine provides. And um, insecticide-treated bed nets were met with, with uh, significant skepticism, but data showed that they could actually have a massive impact on mortality. And as such, they've become the cornerstone, the backbone of our malaria control efforts that have resulted even over 7 million deaths being averted. For Michael Kiangi, Deputy Director for Malaria, Malawi Ministry of Health revealed that the malaria is a huge public health problem in Malawi. We see about 6 million cases each year and we register close to 3,000 deaths each year. Malaria is a huge public health problem in Malawi. We see about 6 million cases each year, and uh, we register uh, close to uh, 3,000 deaths each year. And per day, I would say we register about 8 deaths every day. So it's a quite a huge problem, uh, public health problem in Malawi, and that's why this malaria vaccine, um, which has potential to prevent some cases and also save some lives, as a country, they were quite positive about it and they were happy that uh, we are introducing this vaccine. The UN Security Council adopted a resolution which encourages a survivor-centered approach to preventing and responding to sexual violence in conflict and post-conflict situation. The resolution, which was presented by Germany, calls upon UN member states to strengthen legislation and enhance investigation and prosecution of sexual violence in conflict and post-conflict. Situations consistent with fair trial guarantees under international law. Speaking at the event, UN Chief Antonio Guterres said despite many efforts, sexual violence continues to be a horrific feature of conflicts around the world. Their advocacy highlights two vital elements of our response to sexual violence in conflict. The call for justice and the need for support and assistance to victims. 
while their efforts originate in Iraq and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, they have global impact. And the United Nations is proud to work with victims and survivors to support the movements they have started. I also welcome Ms. Inas Miloud and Ms. Amal Clooney and thank them for their activism and advocacy. Mr. President, it's 10 years since the establishment of the mandate and office of my special representative on sexual violence in conflict. For Barrister Amal Clooney reminded council members that the crimes committed by ISIS against women and girls are unlike anything we have witnessed in modern times. She added ISIS controlled territory the size of the United Kingdom and ruled over 8 million people. More than 40,000 foreign fighters from 110 countries are estimated to have joined ISIS ranks in Iraq and Syria. But the question of bringing them to justice has barely raised a whisper that when this is all over, the ISIS men will just shave off their beards and go back to their normal lives, that there will be no justice. I am legal counsel to Nadia and to other Yazidi women and girls who were kidnapped, bought, sold, enslaved, and raped by ISIS. And my brief is the pursuit of justice. But it was clear from an early stage that this was going to be a challenge. The world's powers were focused on a military solution, and nobody wished to speak about justice. So we fixed on one imperative. We could not allow the evidence to disappear. So Nadia and I came here to the United Nations, and we asked you, the Security Council, for help. We asked that you send a team of investigators to Iraq to gather evidence of ISIS's crimes, so that one day trials would be possible and justice would be within reach. After many months of advocacy, with strong leadership from the United Kingdom and support from Iraq and the United States, Nadia and I sat together in this chamber and watched 15 hands go up and Resolution 2379 come into force. We welcomed the appointment of an eminent lawyer, Kareem Khan, to lead the investigation team. And we celebrated the moment four weeks ago when the team, working alongside the Iraqi authorities, began to exhume mass graves and identify the victim's remains. In Germany, I represent a Yazidi victim in a case in which the German Supreme Court confirmed that the charges against an ISIS commander responsible for sexual slavery amount to genocide. Well, viewers, that's all we have for you on the World Today Evening Bulletin. For more on these and other stories, kindly log on to our website, iafrica.tv. I am Fatma Tajaju. Bye for now. Sinu 
gis nga ku bëgg jëfëndiko ba lo service bi duggal sa play store nga type download app bi nga jëfëndiko ko ci num gëna gaawé 